Well, good morning. You're still in town. <laughs> so, do I dare say Merry Christmas? Happy Holiday? Happy New Year? Uh, there's, there's always been this little bit of a, what I describe an elephant in the room when it comes to Christians talking about Christmas. You ever feel it? You know, and so I, I'm not, in, in, first and foremost, here's my disclaimer. I am not trying to talk you in or out of whatever I'm saying. This morning is going to be kind of really a, hist- a history lesson. But I do want whatever your belief is to be based on knowledge. Because I know mine wasn't. For the longest time, it was just based on what I was told. And, and when I started looking historically at some of these things and pulling it all together, I started going, I, I, that's not really the way I was brought up in thinking about it. I just knew growing, growing up that, well, you know, there were some people, they didn't have trees in their houses. Some, and I didn't understand that. They had kids, but they didn't have trees, or they wouldn't have gifts. Some had gifts, but they didn't have a tree. Some would have a tree and have a star, and some would have a tree and they wouldn't have a star, and that was okay. It's kind of confusing, and depending on what you'd say, it was just that way all along. And, and as a young preacher, when I started preaching, you know, I wouldn't touch this stuff. Here. This is just too delicate. It really, really was. And, and so, you know, I guess, you know, after 20 years, you're kind of like, oh, well. But I think it's important. It's not just an oh well. It's just that the more that I think about some of the customs and traditions that we, we have, and they're not bad, but I really want you to know why you believe what you believe. And like I said, I'm not trying to change anybody to try to switch positions. I'm just going to try to bring you some information and put it into perspective that we can agree with that at least this is where it comes from and how we have all that we have today. And how we should approach it. So, if first first thing is Christmas is not a new thing in the sense of a celebration, a celebration of a time of the year. Every since the, God created us, and the world started spinning and having 365 days a year, the the seasons changed, and in the changes of seasons, now I I base mine on my mountain bike riding and the sunset coming up and going down. And I do like December 21st because now I know and I have a thing on my watch that tells me how many, what the time of sunset is and sunrise. And I notice that it's getting longer now. And I remember in July when I was riding at you know 8, 9 o'clock at night, beautiful, cool, out here in New Mexico anyway. <laughs> and I'm riding along and I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. You know I mean? And then all of a sudden, I noticed that the sunset started creeping down again. And I was like, oh, here we go, you know. And then we got the time change, right? I mean, except for Arizona, again, you weirdos. No, I'm joking. I wish we would. Too. But I just, we, we, our life revolves around changing of seasons. So why are we surprised that cultures before this country and all countries any shape of country, regardless of what country you are in, we live in an environment that changes, and so it affects your life. Some people are very driven around that type of life that is farming. Farming is, is driven on a cycle of seasons. And depending on what time of the season, what you're doing and how you're involved in it, how hard you're working, what you're trying to store up, how it's affected. So there are that. So that's what I want to start with. There's always been kind of this ancient day that peoples would celebrate, they would look at. Most of the time it was referred to as, you know, and this is before Christ, but so we're talking you know, thousands of years before Christ from really the time probably Noah and his family came off the, the boat. But there was a middle winter. There was that time change where all of a sudden they knew that it was going to get warmer. The days were going to get longer, and things were going to change instead of being huddled down. I mean, now, that doesn't mean much for you and me today because we have electricity. We can go 24 hours a day. We can go seven days a week and just go through it. Before we had the, uh, the advent of electricity, <laughs> lights went out, you went home. Now, we still have a few towns, and you may hear this, or maybe I'm just aging myself. You say, well, that city rolls up their sidewalks at sundown. 
Where did that come from? Everybody went home. So their life was really impacted by the length of light of a day. Ours, not so much unless you're like me or some. But. So it's not surprising. I want us to understand that. That it, it was a period of celebration. And the Europeans or the Scandinavians, they had, of course, they have a lot harsher winters. And I mean harsh. We don't have harsh winters. Some people even say we don't even really have winter down here in Las Cruces. Probably even down there where y'all live too, right? They, they're like, we don't have winter. But the Minnesota, they live it up there, they do. I mean, that, that is, and if you look in Germany and you look across Europe and you're trying to raise a family and you don't have a Walmart or you don't have some sort of, you know, backload of the shipping supply demand on the shelves going empty. No, the shelves were what was sitting in your cupboard and that was it. <laughs> you ran out, you starved. Or you, you hoped that somebody in the next house was able to have something that could help tide you through. So those seasons were so important to them. To us, not like again. So in Scandinavia, kind of that European, Nordic area, Finland, Germany, it's, you know, it's all, it's, we call it different names from then. They called it the Yule. Now the Yule, and that's, that's something else I want you to, as I'm talking, I want, you're going to pick up, like I just said the word Yule. We have songs, we have, we've used this word a lot of times, Yule, oh yeah, well, okay, well now we're getting a little familiar, aren't we? That's right, that's what I want you to look at, is that as I mention all these historical things, how that they've all come together and presented themselves in what we know as our modern day Christmas. And so it comes from before Christ as something that was very significant all the way through. So here's one here, that even before Christ, in the Scandinavian countries, they had a day which was, guess what? Guess what it was? It was the winter equinox, December 21st, and they would celebrate Yule. Now, they did it very similar in a lot of things, and this is going to come back to the king, the future king of England. So hold on to this idea of what's going on in Scandinavia in thousands of years, but in the future in England, we're going to come back around and show how this custom that they were using, celebrating the Yule on the 21st, and they would bring in a Yule log. And they would burn that thing. And you can go down and you can get a Yule log. One time we got a Yule log in some sort of a Christmas gathering that we had, and it was from the hospital, and all of a sudden I was like, we didn't even have a fireplace. We're like, what's a Yule log? This guy said, I know what it is. <laughs> I just saw some at Walmart where they have a log that's cut in the middle and it'll sit and you can burn it outside and it'll burn for hours and hours and hours. Now these would burn two weeks. And while that would burn, they would celebrate. They would celebrate life. They would celebrate light. Things were going to get better. The winners were going to lighten up. And slowly, things were going to go back to being warm where we can get out. We didn't chop enough wood that winter, guess what? Well, we complain about having gas bills and stuff like that because they go up in the winter, but look what happened to Texas last year whenever they lost all their power and stuff. So they would bring in this log, they'd burn that log, and it was a feast. And guess what? They drank a lot of beer. They drank a lot of wines, and they had a lot of extra meat. Because Why? Well, you had to kill some of those farm animals because you didn't want to feed them through the winter. You couldn't afford it. So, you know, come the winter, they would take the extra animals and they'd go ahead and slaughter them and prepare them for food. And so they had a lot more meat. But when you got to the midway and the 21st and on, it was like, okay, we can eat up now. We know we have enough meat. We're good. So they would celebrate. The other thing is all the fermentation... It would go into the beer or the wine and stuff. It happened to come. But that's when it was ripe and ready. And so, that's the Yule. So you find this, if you look geographically, look at the earth and you look at the Mediterranean, you look at the equator, right? We all know that around the equator, it's really warm. And again, like us, we don't have really strong winters. And so, to us, 
versus the Scandinavians, it was different. It was a whole lot more about survival. But let's not forget, it still was something significant to those people who live in the warmer countries. The ones that we see, and we're affected by, affected by that we see mostly is the Romans. We have a documented history of some of the things that they did. And so we, we find that right there, where, again, guess what? They're just like people. It's going to affect them. Their days are going to get longer. Things are going to change. Light is different. And they worship pagan gods that we don't agree with, light gods, Mirtha, all these. But one of the feast days that they had set up, because again, it was around the same 21st of December, was Saturnaria. Saturnaria. And they did some weird stuff. Of course, that's Roman for you, right? But, I mean, they, they changed roles. They, they would have the slaves actually become the master, and the master become slave. They did, they did some really weird stuff. And indulgence, of course, just like... But it was a little different. See, the ones in the Scandinavia, I could understand. They, they made it through. The freezer's still full. They didn't have freezers. But, you know, they, they still have lots of food, and so they go ahead and eat and enjoy. We've made it through this deadly winter and stuff. But in the Mediterranean, it was party. It was more about, but they respected the idea that it was changing as well. They still got cold and frost and stuff like that in shorter days. and so. But it's interesting how all of humanity, in a sense, had a point in the year that they recognized as something significant. And so if you're Roman, you had the Greek gods that you had inherited, and so the Greek gods had represented different aspects of nature. And so they figured, well, let's see, we got the days are going to get longer. And so it's going to be more wonderful. So what's the God? It is the sunlight. So between those, Saturnalia was the one with warmth, sun. There's another goddess that they have as well, but it was a big feast party as well. So you have two things in common. You have a very significant time period that all cultures we can see we're celebrating on we can also see that they saw the significance in a chain. Some of them were extremely religious. Some of them were just paganistic religious, but they still were significant, important. You could call them religious, I guess, because it was that rigorous of an idea and thought and the way they participated in it. depends on how you define a religion. But it was also, guess what the day of the goddess of light was? Mirtha. 25th of December. Wow. Starting to see some historical things going on, coming together. But that's not what we really want to know. I want to lay the baseline for some of these things and understand that it supersedes way before Christ. Christians, Jews, and everyone. But what about Christmas when it comes to early Christians? Because that's what we really want to be able to do. Because if we are saying that we are following Christ and we need to follow what he has taught us in his word. And we say the Bible is the word. So we have to know what we're doing. That's what we say. So what about Christmas? Well, the first thing, it wasn't even recognized for 336 years. From the time Christ was born, to 336 years, no mention of anybody, any Christian, any apostle, any disciple, and even the ones for up to the 4th century, ever mentioned his birthday. So now, there you go, go home. Quit celebrating it. Now, I know some want to hear that. You know, and, and again, I'm not trying to change your position. I want you to understand where it's coming from. Because we're not done yet. There's still a lot going on here. But you see the links. We've got a Yule log. We've got a day, a season, very specific. And then when the Roman Empire, because guess what we have? Eventually, we will have what we call the Roman Catholic Church. So now you can start to see things falling together because in 336 A.D. is when we see the Pope of now the Catholic Roman Catholic Church has identified and declared, and it was Pope Julius I, that the 25th of December would become Christmas. And it's, it, it's, not, it's not a secret. It's a Christ mass. It's a Christ worship. 
whatever the Mass entailed. Now, it wasn't called Christmas, though, at first. And we'll talk about that, but that's what we would say is the origin of it. Now, was it on the 25th of December? The God, the Roman God of Son, Martha. Where is he ruling from? Hope? Rome. We start to see some underlying, underpinning things that are going on that we can understand. So from the Middle Ages, from really you know, the establishment of this specific day of Mass, we find that you know, slowly Christianity spread up into the Scandinavian countries. And in doing so, through violence, through conversion, through influence of whatever dominated the, the cultures, the, the Norths, the, the Franks, all of them become do- very dominated by religion. And we start to see there the powerful influence of politics. Charlemagne. Did you know that Charlemagne was a Roman emperor, but it was more up towards the France area, Frankish. You know the day that he was crowned and coronated on? December 25th. Dates are used. You know, we see that, that the way that things, it's not haphazardly either with people when we see that. But the first, it was called, not Christmas, but it was called the Feast of Nativity. The Feast of Nativity. Never had that word. But that's what the Catholics were doing. Some of the Catholics would come together and they would have a church service, which they called Mass. And so it was the non-Catholics it really kind of started putting that on there because they would call, well, you're Catholic and you're going to Christ Mass. You're going to a Mass that's specifically for Christmas. And the Roman Catholic Church eventually, that's what they started calling it, but you know, the Pope decided, no, it's the Feast of Nativity. Now, the irony is, is because, now remember what I said in the, the warmer countries, how did they celebrate that time period? Woohoo! You know, party, enjoyment, celebration. And in the north, how did they? You think you're going to throw that out? You just, you're just not going to get rid of it. They still have cold winters. They're still living everyday lives. So those time periods are still extremely important to those cultures. And so in the south, what did they do? In the Roman Catholic areas that were predominantly uh, occupied by Romans at that time, after they go to Christmas, they'd get drunk. They'd go party. A lot of bad stuff. Hold well, that as well, because this is also going to come back to England, because that's where our roots are. So there's two parts to this that we start to see develop. We start to see this historical event on all cultures on one day. We start to see that it was a part of party and feasting and enjoyment and pleasure. And then we see the Catholic Church formalizing it where it never was for 336 years as a specific day in which they would hold a mass. But it didn't change the hearts of the people. They're just like today. You know, okay, yeah, we went to mass and uh, let's show up down at the bar and grill and let's go ahead and party. And that aspect of it did not change, could not change. And that's going to cause some problems because you have people that are, quote, celebrating this birth of Christ, but man, you sure don't reflect it. And so we have, coming along in the 17th century, in 1645, a very important timeline of a man who gets a lot of credit and a lot of blame for this is you know, Oliver Cromwell. Now, Oliver Cromwell is an amazing guy. Time comes along a time where there's this, you know, we have this battling back and forth where, you know, Catholic influenced by the king or whoever was in power. Queen, Queen Mary was more Catholic. I don't want to go off on all that. And then you have, you know, King James comes along and he's a little more Protestant. But there's that strife between the Protestants and you have the Catholic. And so that creates... But the, the Protestants or the Puritans, as we start to see more of a development, really are disgusted by this idea of you, you go to the church and you turn around and you drunken rivalry, and you're just running around. Puritans were, just like most religions, you had extremism. Now, Cromwell was in the middle. Actually, 
in uh, 1644, when the parliament was basically getting rid of the king, they overthrew the king, executed him. Um, Cromwell was up north with some military forces, and they, he ends up taking over and serving as kind of a, a president, I guess, an intermarry in this and guiding the government stuff. He just endorsed it. He gets the blame that he's the one that got rid of Christmas in England. He's not. He just left it in place. He also was against it because he saw more of the evil sinfulness of it than the celebration. So, guess what he did? He went ahead and did. They kind of outlawed Christmas. Christmas stopped. And there was another part of it because, guess what? It was mass. So when the Puritans took over and had more power in the government, they didn't want anything to do with Roman Catholic. So it was even more comfortable to get rid of it. They just actually changed the name. And they made it really where it was a normal work day. But it did continue to be celebrated because again, you're not going to stop what people have been doing all their lives. Remember England? Where did a lot of their influence come from? Scandinavian. Those Vikings, remember those? There's a lot of movies out now showing those pesky Vikings and how they occupied England forever. Guess what they brought with them? Yeah, they brought their culture too. So you're not going to change. There's a level of that that's not going to change. But there's a battle between the identification of the Roman Catholic Church having a mass and then the celebration and paganistic type of debauchery that would go along with it. And it was a contradiction. And it had become a social class rift. Now, America on its way to becoming a country. And so a lot of the influence that came across from England was what? The Puritans. So you find this religious freedom that's coming over into the colonies. And they don't want to have anything to do with England. <laughs> and what's interesting is Cromwell was actually in support of the concept that every church should have the right to have somebody preached to them. That's one thing he was so against with the Catholic. And he had no qualms going toe-to-toe with the king's bishops. Because he felt that that was something that was their right. The Puritans should have that. So that comes over to America. So as we start to move in to America, we have the same stuff that's going on. We have this. There were no Catholics coming over and establishing colonies in America. In the English. You ever thought of that? How did they come? They came by Mexico. <laughs> a different, but they have theirs as well, because again, where did their traditions come from? Theirs coming from the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. They come in through Mexico and up. But at this point, we have the predominant influences coming from the Puritans, from those coming over and establishing the colonies. And so it, it never was a holiday at all. It wasn't even, they, they, for a while, they didn't have to outlaw it because. It was just dumb. They just said, that's just dumb. Why did they say that? Because they got it. They understood that for 336 years, there was never a talk about his birth. It's not in the Bible anywhere. So why are we going to do it? And on top of that, most of them that are celebrating it are drunkards. Oh, yeah, dumb. We're not, we're not. And there's also that part, we're American. (laughs) We're American. We're going to be different. So, so from 1859, though, to 18, or 16, I'm sorry. Yeah, from 18, 1659 into the 17th century, uh, in Boston, it was just straight up outlawed. No Christmas. Not going to have it. And of course, then after the revolution, we had this idea that all those eagerly customs, that's why we drink coffee. Thank you. Because <laughs> I love coffee. And not tea. Not just because we threw tea in the harbor. It's one of those cultures that we said, <laughs> no, those English love it. We're not English. We're Americans. Well, coffee. So we, we do that. We did that. And we built this country and we started shaping our direction when it comes to all of our holidays. And that's what we start to see. It wasn't even a federal holiday until 1870. Now think about that. The Civil War was... I'll see. I'm glad I'm not throwing a quiz out in this class this morning. 1860, Abraham Lincoln. So it wasn't even until five years after the Civil War 
And all of a sudden it comes back. And it comes back in an interesting way. It's completely reinvented. And it's pretty interesting, you know, how America has taken out, you know, we, we spread throughout the world our democracy and you know, we used to, so you know, take out a lot of good things. It was proud to be an American and, and the world was excited about things that was happening in our continent. And so they would adopt them. Guess what? One of the greatest ones was was Christmas. The influence of it. And the changing of it. And so we see, though, at that same time, something happening in our society, in our country. And it really is a class conflict. And so you have this holiday, you know, and this celebration and stuff during certain times of the year. Now, why did they do that? Because they were blessed. They, they either had enough to make it through the year or they didn't. But it was kind of like the pinnacle point of the worst time of the year. So guess while that influenced people in America that were working jobs where bosses were just killing them and taking every dime they could. And it was a terrible time to honestly be a worker in America. You think your job stinks? Oh, you're talking horrible. OSHA? No. <laughs> There's no way, OSHA. You, you're probably familiar with some of the things that we have now in place called child labor laws. Not then. We need some extra timber to show up that coal mine. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's going to cost too much. No. <sighs> Caves in, 20 workers killed. Boss goes, well, get 20 more. Let's go. Dig them out. Cow. American people were getting fed up with that. So when we, if you think about the time, we come out of the Civil War, we start getting into an industrial revolution. But then we start seeing the way that the class struggle is fighting back and forth. Christmas becomes a holiday, but it's still not quite the same. There was a lot of rioting that was going on because, yeah, you have the haves and you have the absolute have-nots, nothing. And the haves were partying and enjoying that time of the year. And the have-nots were just suffering so horribly. And they didn't get it. The haves didn't get it. They didn't understand. What's wrong with them? I own the property. It's my mine. Everything's mine. The air, okay, well, maybe not the air. But the air in the coal mine is mine. Everything is mine. I deserve it. You're lucky. I get to you, you get to work for me for, you know, half a penny a day. But there's an interesting transition and it comes through literature. And it comes with Washington Irving. He liked Christmas. He traveled to England and lived over there for a while. And while he was over there, they're still celebrating it the British way. He liked the festive side of it. He thought it was a great thing. But he also saw the paradox, the kind of dilemma that was creating. He comes back and he writes some short essays. One of them is Christmas and one of them is the Yule. Another one is, you know another one? Well, I'll let you look it up. Because he not only influenced Christmas, but also Halloween. But that started catching on. And, and he started expressing this idea of joy, not the debauchery of you know, sinfulness, but the idea of, of love for one another. You know, the time to come together, to be together. And he saw that, that there were good things about Christmas in England where families would be together and they would share a meal together and they would put up a tree and they had all this stuff going on. And so in that, it started happening. He said it going forward. And then... Guess what the next big one was? Charles Dickens. This book right here, A Christmas Carol. I just watched it the other day. And if you've been listening to the way I've been talking, that's one of the things that Charles Dickens nails. And they, and they say he, that's one of the brilliance of him as an author is the fact that he was able to take the psychological side of what was going on in the class warfare and expose it. And he did it so amazingly. It depends on what version you watch. <laughs> the one I watched, oh man, it was raw. Ebenezer Scrooge, you just see the callousness that he has towards you know, Tiny Tim and his family and stuff. 
doesn't care. And all those events that go through there start to really awaken within all Americans. This ain't right. There's something wrong. And so that is something that he exposed with the idea of charity, giving to others, and focusing on the unity of love and stuff. Where did that tree come in? Right? Where did that, that tree? Because that's, that's to me, because I mean, I've always been taught that, that that's the nail in it. That's right there. It's that tree. And depending on how you've been taught and how you view it, okay, the tree could be a problem. It can. I, I, under, I respect that. There were several pagan um, cultures that used trees. Now, if you remember the Scandinavians, what did I say they did? They would bring in, and they had evergreen trees. That was one thing that they also did. Where they would set up a tree. You know why? Because everything was dead. They'd bring in this beautiful green tree and say, look, we're at the point where life is changing now. Things are going to come alive. And they would have this beautiful green tree inside there. Nothing to do with Odin or none of that. And they burned the Yule log. They have the other side of it where the pagans, we know they actually would turn it into an idol. And they would worship it that way. So we have a mixture of views on how you see this happening. But again, what timeline? Where was it all happening? What I think is interesting is, again, remember I said things come back around to England over to us. This is something that we see that was brought over by Washington, Irvin Washington. Was he saw trees. And he saw the way they were decorated. And he's like, that's beautiful. That's gorgeous. And that's what he had brought in his story. And so that's how it started becoming contagious as people started seeing it. But it's kind of a neat story because that originated in the 1600s with Prince Albert. Now remember, they were always marrying for you know, power and stuff, but Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Well, Queen Victoria needed a husband, so she ends up marrying Prince Albert, German. German. Guess what he's bringing to the castle? He's bringing his culture, isn't he? And you know what the queen said? Go for it. She told him. She said, celebrate it the way you normally do in Germany. So he got him a tree. He brought it in. People dressed up. And, people, and it, it, it was like the fashion. I mean, everybody saw, what's the queen wearing? You know, we do that today, don't we? We look at people and say, well, what did so-and-so wear? Do you see what they have? At the castle, you know, where the queen lives, you know, I mean, they, they, they put up this tree, and so everything, so the tree came in as a part of Yule. It came across from the idea of the Scandinavian beliefs and how they brought it in. Well, now let's narrow it down. But Ron, it's still, we've got we to gotta determine, is this something that we should be participating in or have anything to do with? Well, Let's start with Galatians 4, where Paul talks here, because it is important. This is a very needful understanding. Paul says, you are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Now, I've been nailed with that one. Okay, there it is. Context, context, context. Okay, context. What's he talking about? He's talking to specific people in a specific generation, a specific area. There's an application, though, that I do not want to take away from, or otherwise I would have used it. But there is a problem when it becomes a hindrance in between your faith and serving God, and celebrating these days is something that's extremely important that we should not be. So the tree... You want to look at the tree. Well, there's no Christmas trees. Sorry. There's no Christmas trees, Christmas trees. Again, remember what I said, 336 years, there was never even Christmas. There's not a tree anywhere associated with the birth of Jesus. But if we look at trees and the use of trees, that's what's important. Because in Jeremiah chapter 10, this is where we find this idea. Now, this is pagan worship. This is what Jeremiah's talking about. He says, starting in verse 1, what I hear the Lord says to you, people of Israel, the Lord says, do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by the signs in heavens, though the nations are terrified by them. 
for the practices of the people are worthless. They cut down a tree out of the forest, and the craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with a hammer, nails, so that it will not totter like a scarecrow or a cumberman, carried because they cannot walk and are taught by worthless idols. What's he talking about? Very clearly, he's pointing out a culture of people who are taking a tree, and he says they're cultures, they're worthless. And he goes on and says, worthless wooden idols, hammered silver, brought from Tarshish, and gold from Uphaz. What craftsmen and silver goldsmith have made is then dressed in blue and purple, all made by skilled workers. Tell them this, these gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. But what about the tree in Christmas? Does this have anything to do? Jews weren't worshiping. That's exactly what he was saying. But it wasn't about just the tree, was it? No, it was about paganistic worship. If we back up and we look again. He says, I want you to understand. Do not be afraid. Don't take it because all their cultures and stuff are worthless. Because you find, and then he gives a specific example. This is one example of all. They take a tree bring it in, and they turn it into an idol that they worship in the shape of a god. Anybody doing that? Then you, i got a problem. <laughs> if you're taking your Christmas tree and chiseling it into an idol, okay, now, now we got a problem. But that's, that's not the same. He says, it's the craftsman. And they're making it into something. They're making it into something that's worthless. So as far as all these things, then we have to look at, okay, well, that, and that, honestly, I mean, that's the reference. And that's what I would kind of be told was, well, you know, it's, it's the, the Christmas tree is worshiping a pagan god. And you can disagree with me, and I'm fine with that, honestly. You know, I'm, I, I have no problem, and I, I'm not trying to tell you to celebrate it, not to, to put a tree up, or don't ever... Again, I want you to understand where it comes from that we have these ideas. Because that's what I was taught. I, I, I don't know. You know, I blame the generation before me of everything that I'm dumb about. I always say, ah, it was that's the way I was taught. I don't know. Maybe it's just the impression I got. That by putting a tree in my house, that I was somehow worshiping a tree. And so I did things like, well, let's just not put a star on it. Let's just not put figurines of Jesus or certain things on it, stuff like that. But it was still a tree in my house. I have one now. But I want you to understand, it's not in the same context of what Jeremiah is talking about. Now, there's other things. So that brings us to this idea of where, how do we handle the conflict or the disagreements and stuff like that. And, and I have to go over to Romans chapter 14. And I'd like you to join me there because I think that this, again, context. You know, we have to put it into the cultural context. Here, Paul is addressing the issue of some people who are going down to the meat market and they were getting meat and you had a couple of different sources. Kind of like today, you know, you could go down to Pete's, you know, well, I guess that's gone now, but you could go down to Walmart or Albertsons, the different sources, and you can get their meat. You can get grain fed, you can get all different types of meat. Somebody comes to my house, you know, and. My, my beef wasn't grain-fed, you know, it might offend somebody. They might go, oh, I'm sorry, man. I wasn't raised. What do you call it? Organic. There it is. That's what I'm thinking of. I only eat organic meat. And I still don't understand a vegetarian hamburger. Sorry. Change the name. Hamburger. Meat. And not too bad I had one. See how it could be offensive? We, I mean, today? So we have a culture that he's talking about where you, they took the meat that was offered specifically and sacrificed to a foreign paganistic god. You have Christians who used to worship like that. You have Christians who never worshiped like that. That they would come from the Jewish tradition and holiday, I mean, not holidays, but, you know, mosaic law and stuff. But you brought them together into one group of people, and now you have the people who are so offended by it because that's what they used to do. And in their rejection of their foreign practices, they said, any meat that has ever 
offered and sold after it's been offered as a sacrifice is wrong. Nobody can eat it. And they were imposing it as a, like a church. Nobody in this group can have any meat in their house that has ever come from the Diana meat market. Diana was their god. And then you had those that were saying, oh, you're ridiculous. No. What well, you have, you start having Christians pitting themselves against each other. And that's when Paul steps in with it. So now, okay, we're not talking about me. We're talking about holidays and, and trees and stuff. But it fits. So let's listen to what he says. And we're starting in verse 1, 14. As for those who are weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One who believes may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Is it before his own master that he stands or falls? And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So I, that, that to me pumps the brakes for me. When I start to look at things in the way that you may celebrate or not celebrate, I, you know, I, I look at that and I have to understand, okay, may, and he, actually he's, he's blasting those who have the knowledge that know better and tell them, put up with it. You get it. You know that the meat's nothing. But if they're very offended by it, then let them abstain from it. So if you are the mature one and, and you feel that there's nothing wrong with a tree, but we have people who say the tree is an abomination, how do we apply this principle? Don't make it an issue. Now, the problem I have is at the beginning is what's an opinion? What's an opinion? But that's, that's what he said. He goes, you know, quarrel over an opinion? I, don't, I dare say anyone would say that what they believe is an opinion, right? What's an opinion? Because if I say that what I have is an opinion, it weakens my stance, doesn't it? Well, my opinion, oh, well, there you go, opinion. It's not scripture. There, there's a wedge you could start to drive in there, but the opinion is based on faith. Because both have opinions that have been derived from faith. Faith comes by hearing God's Word. But both have received the same identical Word, but both now have a different view, which Paul says is an opinion. You share the same Word, but you're looking at it differently. So when we talk about this type of culture of eating the meat or not eating the meat, he says, don't. And then who are you to judge? Who are you to judge him? He says he's going to stand or fall in front of God by himself. He doesn't need your help. I added that. So going on in verse 5, and then he says, one person esteems one day. Oh, wow, here we go. We're getting a little closer, right? One esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, one observes it with honor for the Lord. The one who eats, eats honor of the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord, gives thanks to God, for none of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. We share something. So when we look at those, we have to be very careful about it. And then, continuing in 8 and 10, For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that we might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Are you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat. Twice he's brought that up again. 
Is it worth your judgment to cause a brother to stumble? When the tightest scripture that I can identify, I can look in Galatians like I brought up earlier and say, no, there's not one day better than the other. And it should not be revered in that sense. So that, that's the problem I have is, you know, sometimes we'll have people who will celebrate one day and say, oh, but we can't celebrate Christmas. But you're celebrating other days. I'm just saying, you know, we treat Thanksgiving sometimes like a religious holiday, even Church of Christ, but not that Christmas. <laughs> but if you're mature, you understand it's not Christ's birth. But what a season. Look, I'm seeing people I haven't seen forever. We have people traveling through that we get to meet, and we get to talk about Jesus Christ, don't we? You're not going to talk much about the gospel on Halloween, are you? You're not going to get opportunities to share about the glorious salvation that you have because of that birth. His birth is important. But for 338 years, we know that it wasn't as important as what? His death. Because we see from the time of the day of Pentecost, every First day of the week, they celebrated his death. And they never did a pilgrimage back to Jerusalem to his grave. Why? Why did Christians never put up some form of a memorial to a location? Because they celebrated every Sunday the idea of his death, burial, and resurrection. And he's not there. He's with the Father. I hope it unwrapped Christmas a little bit for you. I'm not trying to be heavy about it. I want, again, stay firm in your beliefs, but have a knowledge behind what you're saying. And don't make it something that we're going to divide over. And I have to be the same way. I've never tried to do anything that would cause somebody to be upset that did not believe in it. There were people that did not believe in having a Christmas tree, and I didn't have a potluck at my house if I had one up. I wouldn't do those things. Because I knew there would be some that would come that were Christians and they would be offended by it. So I didn't do it. Now, I could have been like what Paul said, well, well, I know there's nothing about a tree. And that Jeremiah, that's all about just building a pagan idol. But my brother believes that it's wrong. And I need to love him more than I love myself. That's what Christ did. And I think that's what Christ through Paul is saying. Put that stuff aside. Let's enjoy it for what it is with the knowledge that we have about it. If you're here this morning and you're not with Christ, and when I say with Christ, I'm talking about the way that the first century Christians did it. They became with Christ by being baptized, having those sins washed time and time and time again throughout the book of Acts. We see that end product of a teaching of the gospel was immersion. Every one of them. So that's how people knew in the first century how to be in Christ. You haven't done that, you're not in Christ. You're not. You can be in Christ and lost. Despite some teachings, we can lose our salvation. We don't get rebaptized. What we need to do is turn to Him. And I heard Brother Dale Wilson used to call it the Christian bar of soap. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, he called it the Christian bar of soap. Y'all ever heard that? Basically, what it is is. That as we sin, we defile ourselves as Christians. We're already in Him. But what do we need to do? We need to turn to Him. And when we turn to Him, we ask for forgiveness. And He is faithful to forgive us every time. And we are washed by the blood of Christ. Not a continual blood sacrifice, but a spiritual figurative one. And that's why He said, that's the Christian bar. So, I loved it. It took me a while too to kind of, what? What did He mean by that? We need to be washed in the blood again. So that's my present to you. That I hopefully the knowledge of what we're doing, use it as an opportunity to love others, to focus upon your families, be joyful, help use these opportunities to take Christ to those that are now in a mood of celebrating his birth day. And don't be offensive. If you need some help in your relationship with him, I hope you'd let us know. 
And if you're comfortable, come forward while we stand and sing.